and 86 as they finally replace. Can we thank Mr. Bell for leading the singing thus far? We're singing well. The 386, page 332. Love divine, all love's excelling, joy of heaven to earth come down. Fix in us thy humble dwelling, all thy faithful mercies count. Let's stand as we sing and sing with all our hearts, uh, 386. Let's stand together. Love divine, oh love. Now let's come before the Lord in a word of prayer together, please. Let's still our hearts around the throne of grace. Eternal God and loving Heavenly Father, we do thank Thee for love divine, all loves excelling. We realize that truly, of a surety, there is no love like the love of Jesus, never to fade or fall. We realize that there may be many types of love in this world, a love between a husband and a wife, a love between a parent and a child, a love between friends, a love even between close acquaintances. And yet we know there is no love 
like the love that was bestowed upon us from on high. We thank Thee for the love that we find in the Scriptures, the love of God. We rejoice in John 3 and the verse 16, for God so loved. What words they are, how they echo in our souls and create a thrill and a joy like nothing could, nothing else could. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We thank thee for other verses, like greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Or Romans 5, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Oh God, we thank Thee and we praise Thee for love divine. And truly we can say it excels when it comes to comparison to any other love. There is no love like the love of God to our souls. And we rejoice in this love. We rejoice in it being bestowed upon Thy people we rejoice that it was this love that brought Christ all the way down from the glories of heaven, caused him to live that perfectly righteous and obedient life. We rejoice that it was that love that caused him to go to Calvary's hill, to die upon that middle tree. It was that love that caused him to suffer the physical anguish of the whip and the lashing of the nail and the crown of thorns. It was the love of God that caused him to endure the mocking and the deridings of men. And yet all the more it was the love of God that caused him to drink of the cup of the Father's wrath for our souls as divine justice was done and he bore our hell upon the tree. Oh, surely there is no love like this love and we thank thee for it. It was this love that caused him to shed his precious blood, blood that would make us as white as snow, blood that would give us atonement and redemption, blood that would cover all of our sins. And we thank thee that still tonight there is power in the blood of the Lamb, power to save, power to redeem, power to transport a soul into heaven's glory. And oh, we rejoice in the love that caused the blood to be shed. And oh God, we do pray, if there be one in our number that as yet is without Christ, they, they know nothing about salvation, they, they have no time for God, no time for Christ, no time for the love of God, and yet thou hast drawn them under this roof, drawn them into a place where they will be exposed to the gospel. Oh, Father, we pray that thou be pleased to send thy Spirit to convict them of their sin, to show them the beauty of Christ, and that with great help from the Spirit of God, they would repent and believe the gospel tonight while they find themselves still in time and still in the day of grace. Oh, God, answer our cries. We rejoice to see each one in, and we pray that thou would save the, un, uh, the, the, the unconverted as yet in our midst. We pray that thou would, even through the gospel, stir up the souls of thy people, that the hearts of thy people would be blessed as we consider Calvary again. And we pray that this will be a blessed hour as we worship thee in spirit and in truth. But, O oh God, how we pray for our church family tonight. Thou knowest the need amongst our church family. We pray for those that are shut in tonight. Bless them in their souls. Bless them. They would love to be out, and yet they can't be here. Bless them wherever they find themselves. Lord, we pray for those that are feeling sickness and feeling the weariness that comes with age or, or any of those things that can burden thy people at this hour. Oh God, give them a little relief in these moments and we pray that thou bless them in days to come. And oh Father, we ask even among our church family for those that have been bereaved of late and those that are still feeling the loss of a bereavement even in the last year and and today especially, maybe, it's keenly upon their hearts. 
Oh, God, bless them abundantly. Wrap thy loving arms about them. Give them peace that only thou canst give. And we pray that they may find great consolation even tonight in the love of God that is freely offered to their souls afresh. But, oh, God, bless us now. Help us in our worship of thee. Help us to do everything to thine honor and to thy glory alone. We ask these things in and through the altogether lovely name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Hymn number 394, please. Hymn number 394, page 336. O Christ, in thee my soul hath found, and found in thee alone the peace, the joy I sought so long, the bliss till now unknown. And a wonderful chorus here now, none but Christ can satisfy. And I trust each one will be able to say none other name for me. Hymn number 394, standing as we sing. hands but when you look at a chorus what we're singing there there's none but Christ can satisfy and I've never seen some such miserable faces as we sing that it really is wonderful truth let's sing it like we mean it none other name for me verse 2 I sighed for rest and happiness I sighed for rest and happiness I That's wonderful singing. Now we're turning in the Word of God together, please, to the New Testament book of the Ephesians, the Epistle of Paul to the Ephesians, chapter 2. We're going to read the whole of this chapter, all 22 verses tonight, and then tonight we're going to, in the will of the Lord, consider the verse 14. Now those of you that were 
here on Wednesday night will know that it was the verse 14 that disappeared on me and eluded me. But now that we've found it, what a truth it really is. And I trust that the Lord will bless it to our souls. But Ephesians chapter 2, beginning our reading at the verse 1 together, please. Ephesians 2 verse 1, And you hath he quickened who are dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and whereby nature the children of wrath even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us, through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of petition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. We trust the Lord will bless the public reading of his holy and precious word to each of our hearts tonight. At this point in the service, let me welcome each one to the house of God. It is lovely to see each one again tonight. And we especially welcome those visiting with us, trusting the Lord will bless you as you fellowship with us in Monish Lane. For the week ahead of us on Monday, the session will be meeting at 8 p.m. Then on Wednesday, our prayer meeting and Bible study at 8 p.m. And then the youth fellowship, we're going to be going along to Tolly Vallon's youth praise service uh, uh, on Friday nights, so we'll be meeting at the church at the earlier time uh, of 10 to 7. So please remember that. I know it's a, a great deal earlier, but I know you're always good at uh, getting here on time so that we can enjoy that time away. But 10 to 7 in the church car park here for the Youth Fellowship. And then also on Friday evening is the late night men's prayer meeting, 10 p.m. through to 11 p.m. Then the services next Lord's Day, the Sabbath school and Bible class at 10.45 and the morning worship at 12 noon, preceded by prayer at 11.30 and then the evening gospel service at 7 p.m., preceded by prayer at 6.30. And I would encourage God's people, don't be a stranger to the pre-service prayer meeting either. 
But you come along and you pray and pray for the Lord's blessing upon our worship services next Lord's Day. And then today is our Whitfield College Covenant offering. And let me thank you for the money that was raised for the Ugandan Christian School that came to £545. And we do thank you for that in the Saviour's name. Uh, please remember the sign-up sheet for the current magazine. That's £10 for the year. And then there's the menus for the church dinner. That'll be on Friday the 17th of March at 7.30. You can take the menus with you, fill them out, put them in the post box in the hallway, and also just uh, put the payment in an envelope clearly marked. That that's the purpose that it's for. And we look forward to a wonderful night on the 17th of March. And then one last appeal for the LTBS sign-up sheet, please. That's on Thursday the 2nd of March. And as I said this morning, today is the last day. We need as many as possible. And I know maybe a Thursday night or dark evenings, any of those things can put people off. But we do need numbers, and I trust that you'll put your name to that even tonight. And then for the committee... Let me remind you that our next meeting is Monday the 26th of February, a week tomorrow at 8 p.m. Therefore, any items for the agenda should be submitted to the committee secretary, Mr. Bell, before Saturday, please. And then one last announcement that I omitted uh, to say this morning, that the committee have installed a defibrillator in the church, uh, church hall porchway. So as you're coming into the hallway there, there's a defibrillator in a, a cabinet there, God willing. Hopefully we will never have to use it, but nonetheless it makes the congregation aware that those things are there now in case of an emergency, and that is accessible to all. But please do pray for those that are sick, those shut in. Please especially remember those bereaved. There are those feeling very keenly the loss of a loved one of late, but of course all of these announcements are subject to the will and mind of the Lord. We're going to sing again now, please. Hymn number 210. Hymn number 210. And we'll keep our seats while our tithes and offerings are collected up for the work in this place. But 210, page 261. The love that Jesus had for me to suffer on the cruel tree that I a ransomed soul might be is more than tongue can tell. 210, keeping our seats.
Amen. And it's wonderful. His love is more than tongue can tell. We're turning in the Word of God back to that portion we read earlier, Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to be taking as our text the words of the verse 14, looking at the title, The Barrier of Sin. The Barrier of Sin. And the Word of God tells us, Ephesians 2 verse 14, For He is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. We're really focusing on those final words of the verse 14, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, the barrier of sin. Let's bow in a word of prayer together, asking for the Lord's help upon the preaching tonight. Heavenly Father, we ask for thy help. We pray that thou touch my lips with a live coal from off the altar. I pray that thou give me liberty and boldness to preach. Help me to preach in the power and demonstration of the Spirit of God. We ask that each heart may be attentive to thy word, including the preacher's heart. And, O oh, Father, we pray that thou move in the hearts and lives of men and women, boys and girls, saved by thy grace. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Ephesians chapter 2 is uh, quite a remarkable chapter. When you look at the first three verses, we find that our sin is exposed to us. And it's not very pleasant to look at, and yet it's important that we do. The verse 1 tells us, And you hath he quickened who are dead in trespasses and sins. You see, that was our condition in our sin. You see, people like to trivialize sin. People like to say sin isn't really that bad. People like to say, well, sin is something I can play with, I can trifle with. It's something I can get away with. No. Sin causes death, who are dead in trespasses and sins. Verse 2 tells us we walked according to the course of this world. We were followers of the devil, According to the prince of the power of the air, verse 2 tells us that we were the children of disobedience. If you're still in your sin, you're still following the world, you're still following the devil, and you're still a child of disobedience. Verse 3 tells us that all the world wants is the loss of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And where by nature, in other words, this is the condition they were born in, born the children of wrath. What very solemn words. Then we find in the verses 4 through to 9, the remarkable intervention of Christ. Because our sin is so serious that we are depraved in our sin. But the verse 4 tells us, but God... And I've underlined that in my Bible, and I trust you have as well, because that is the turning point. That is how a man, a woman, a boy, a girl, a young person, whoever is here tonight, that is how you are changed and transformed and saved and redeemed by God. The fact that God intervenes in your condition. A remarkable truth. Then the verse 10 tells us that we are his workmanship. You know, I'm sure each and every one of us have met someone and you say, there's no work in that boy. <laughs> you ever met anyone like that? Maybe I know too many of them. There's no work in him. But you know, we are created to work. We are created for service. We are created to be holy. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And then interestingly enough, and coming now closer to our text, the verse 11 and the verse 12 highlights the differences between the Jews and the Gentiles. And this is initially what our text is talking about when it talks about the middle wall of partition being broken down. It's talking in one sense about the barrier, the differences between the Jew and and the Gentile being broken. Look at the verse 11. It says, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh. Who's he writing to? 
He's writing to the church at Ephesus. He's writing to, to Gentiles. He's not writing to anyone in Israel per se. He's writing to, to Gentiles, to foreigners when it comes to the Jews. And he says, being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, and look at it, verse 11, who are called on circumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. In other words, the Jews call you the uncircumcision. Verse 12, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. And yet we find in the verses 13 through to 16, including our text, we then find the unity that both Jew and Gentile can experience in Christ. The fact that essentially it doesn't matter whether you are born Jewish or born in one of the other nations around the globe. It says in the verse 13, But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. And with that in mind, verse 14, For he is our peace who hath made both, referring to Jew and Gentile, hath made both one, one people, the people of God, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. These are really quite remarkable words. In fact, when we look at the verse 14, and it refers to this middle wall of partition being broken down, as I referred to on Wednesday night, it's referring to, in the temple, you would have had something called the great court of the Gentiles. The great court of the Gentiles. And it was a place where the Gentiles could come when they're approaching the temple. And it was about 750 uh, foot square. It was a very large area in that sense. But to one side of it, nearest to the temple itself, there was this four and a half foot high wall. And it gave this warning in both Latin and in Greek saying that no Gentile is to pass this wall under pain of death. They were not welcome in the temple. They were not the people of God in that sense. And that's what the verses 11 and 12 are talking about. You are Gentiles, you are the uncircumcised in time past without Christ, being aliens, strangers, foreigners from the commonwealth of Israel and therefore no hope without God in the world. That's what it's saying. And Paul is using this illustration of this, the, the temple and this Greek courtyard and this wall separating Jew and Gentile and saying now in Christ... This middle wall of petition, it's broken down between us in Christ. It's broken down. Now, rightly, that wall was put up at one time. The Jews were God's chosen people. Come with me to Deuteronomy chapter 7. We see this. The word of God is very clear on this issue. We looked at this verse, in fact, this morning, but we'll look at it again, and it'll do us no harm to look at it. Deuteronomy chapter 7, and it's important we look at it because we're going to be looking at other verses in this portion as well. In Deuteronomy chapter 7 and the verse 6, we find the Lord highlights the children of Israel, the children of Abraham, if you will, as God's chosen people. And we find in Deuteronomy chapter 7 and the verse 6, we find the Lord's declaration, For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself, above all people that are upon the face of the earth. But then we find the difference between the Jew and the Gentile. Maybe you wonder what the name Gentile means. The name Gentile in the plural just means the nations, referring to other countries or other people groups, referring to the Gentiles, just a broad scope for every other nation that is not Jewish in that sense. That's what the word Gentile means, not of God's people. But scripturally in the Old Testament, oftentimes the Gentiles pictured a people, they're a sinful people, a people that served other gods, a people that had other religions, a people that had no time for God in that sense, and therefore there was a definite distinction and a, a wall between Jew and Gentile. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 
7 and the verse 7 with me. We find the Lord tells us something. It says, The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any people, for ye were the fewest of all people. So the Lord tells us something. He, he's chosen the weak things of the world, similar to what the Apostle Paul tells us in the New Testament. The Lord has gloried in this people. Look at the verses 9 and 10 of that cha same chapter. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. But look what it says about the Gentiles, verse 10. And repair them that hate him to their face to destroy them. He will not be slack to him that hateth him. He will repay him to his face. Look at the verses 17 and 18. Concerning the other nations, concerning the nations that at this particular time had no particular love for the Lord. Verse 17. If thou shalt say in thine heart, these nations are more than I, how can I possess them? Thou shalt not be afraid of them, but shalt well remember what the Lord thy God did unto Pharaoh and unto all Egypt. And we find this, this clear distinction but then when we find Paul writing to the Ephesians, we see Paul is saying that now it doesn't matter whether it be Jew or, or Gentile, and he's writing to Gentiles, he's writing to non-Jewish people, and he's telling them that the gospel is not just for the Jew, and further to that, the gospel has never been exclusively for the Jew. You say, how do you know that? Well, you think of characters in the scripture, you think of Ruth. She was a Moabitess. Yet in Christ, that middle wall of petition was broken down. Who else? Well, you think of Rahab in Jericho. She was a, a, a Gentile in that sense. And yet in Christ, well, the middle wall of petition was broken down. You think of possibly, arguably, the greatest revival ever known in human history in the city of Nineveh when possibly a million souls are saved. None of those people were Jews. But in Christ, the middle wall of partition was broken down. You see, in Ephesians 2 and the verse 14, this middle wall of partition... It's not just a wall between Jew and Gentile. It's actually what the Jew and the Gentile practically and symbolically represent, that the Jew is meant to represent the child of God, the Gentile represents the heathen, and we find this wall is in particular referring to the difference between God's people and the devil's crowd. That's the difference. Now, I want you to note that is why I term it the barrier of sin. Because it's sin that prevents men coming to God. It is sin that prevents men from being saved. It is sin that prevents individuals from trusting Christ and joining that holy band. And therefore, this middle wall of partition, it's more than just a separation between Jew and Gentile, but it's about sin and holiness and Christ. So I want you to note three things with me tonight. I want you to note, number one, the reason for the barrier. Number two, the removal of the barrier. And thirdly, the reconciliation after the barrier. As I've already said, number one, the reason for the barrier. The barrier isn't about nationhood now. It's not about Jew or Gentile. It's about sin. And I'll tell you why. Come with me to Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7, because the Bible makes it perfectly clear, and it makes it perfectly clear in the Old Testament too, by the way, as I've already highlighted with characters like Ruth and Rahab and Nineveh, even though they seem to be exceptions rather than the rule. But we find that there will be people from all nations in heaven, all nations, all colors, all types of people and languages and tongues and all the rest of it, all will be gathered in heaven around the throne of God. All nations represented in the glory. Revelation 7 and the verses 9 and 10 tell us, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, 
of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues. And where are all these people, Jew and Gentile alike? They stood before the throne, verse 9, and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. You see, it's more than just about nationhood. It's about sin. Come with me to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, the apostle Paul deals with this truth again, that in Christ, Jew and Gentile can be united, and it's about the people of God uh, separating from the devil's crowd. That's what the barrier is about. And it's sin that is that barrier. And we find in Romans chapter 1 and the verse 16, the Apostle Paul tells us again, it's not about nationhood, not about what nation you're in, as to whether that will determine whether you trust Christ or are right with God. Romans 1 verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And it says, For it is the power of God unto salvation, look at it, to everyone that believeth. And then just to distinguish that, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, to Jew and Gentile. So when we consider this, sadly, this is something that was uh, not really understood by many of the early Christians. Come with me to Galatians chapter 2, because we find that the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter actually ended up having a, a debate about this in the presbytery, and we find James as a moderator, and you read the details of it more fully in the book of Acts. But we find Paul alludes to it here when he writes to the Galatians. And Galatians chapter 2 and the verses 11 and following, we find that Paul gives a little account about this, his, his debate with Peter over this issue, whether to, you have to be a Christian and a Jew or, or, or however it works, that nationhood isn't the key. It's being united in Christ is the key. And Galatians 2 and the verse 11 but when Peter was come to Antioch, look what it says. I would stood him to the face because he was to be blamed. <laughs> it's very serious language, isn't it? I had a debate with this man. I would stood him and he was to be blamed for this confusion. That's Paul talking about a fellow brother in Christ, Peter, verse 12. For before that certain came... Uh, from James, he did eat with the Gentiles, but when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. What's gone on here? We find there's been a disagreement. Peter has led the way, and as a Jew, he said, I'm not going to eat with those Gentiles. Even though they're in Christ, even though they're saved, even though they're part of the family of God, he's led this sort of bit of a sect and said, no, I'm not going to eat with them. And we find actually Barnabas got carried away with that too. And Paul would stood him over this. Look at the verse 14. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, it's a strong language. He confronts Peter. I said unto Peter before them all, if thou being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. You see, Paul outlines to Peter, withstands him in front of everyone. This is a very serious time, and he's saying, essentially, Peter, cut it out. You're causing schism in the church and you're preaching something that is wrong. Jew and Gentile are united in Christ and the middle wall of partition is broken down because the wall is not about where you are born or the people group you are born into. It's about whether you be in Christ or not. And with that in view that the barrier really isn't about whether you're a Jew or a Gentile or your family line or your traditions or what country you were born into or anything like that, but the actual barrier that separates men from coming to God is this barrier of sin. 
With that in view, look at Ephesians 2 in the verse 1 again. This is the problem. Sin is the problem. Sin is the issue. It's not about where you were born or how you were born or anything else. It's about sin. You who were dead in trespasses and sins. Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world. I ask, is this still you? Is there a barrier between you and God? Is there a barrier? Is there something stopping you from being saved? Is there something stopping you? Is there a middle wall of petition separating you from coming into the holy of holies and, and being reconciled to God? Is it that still you're dead in your sin? Is it still that you're walking with the world? Is it still that you're following the devil? Is it still, verse 2, that you're part of the children of disobedience? Is it still that you're following the lusts of the flesh? Is it still that you're part of this group that we're by nature the children of wrath even as others? Is that the reason why you are not right with a holy God tonight? Because actually it's not a barrier of who you were born into, the family line, or what your surname is, or what your color of skin may be, or what your nationhood may be, or anything like that. It's just simply, are you in Christ or not? And I ask, is your sin stopping you from being right with a holy God? Because your sin does stop you. Sin is the problem. Sin is the issue. Not a lot of people will tell you that. Well, I want to tell you that because it's the truth. Come with me to 1 Samuel 2 because your sin bars you, stops you, literally forbids you from having any unity, reconciliation or peace with God. Your sin is the issue. And why? Well, you may think nothing too much about your sin. You may think your sin is a trivial, a light thing, something you can trifle with. But God hates your sin. God is a holy God. He is a, a righteous God. And 1 Samuel 2 and the verse 2, we find Hannah touches on this as she prays. And it's wonderful words. She says, there is none holy as the Lord. There is none holy as the Lord, for there is none beside thee. If you can think in your mind who is the holiest possible character you can conjure up in your mind upon the face of the earth, you remember the Lord is holy beyond compare. There is none holy as the Lord. This is our God. And He is so holy that He hates your sin and your sin quite literally bars you from having peace with Him. Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 13 says, Concerning the Lord, thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil and canst not look on iniquity. That's what our sin is. A barrier, a wall of separation, a middle wall of partition separating us. Like traditionally in the temple, the Gentile was kept out of the holy place of the temple. So our sin quite literally bars or separates us with the same sort of language upon pain of death from entering anything that is holy with the Lord. You see, your sin might not seem too serious to you. It's very serious to the Lord. Very serious to the Lord. That is the reason for the barrier. Your sin. But then secondly, I want you to note the removal of the barrier. The removal of the barrier, because as we've read in Ephesians chapter 2 and the verse 1, that we were dead in trespasses and sins and we walked in accordance with the world, the devil, disobedience, uh, following our lusts, the children of wrath. You say, what can I do? How, how, how on earth can this barrier ever be removed? Well, verse 13 gives you the answer. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh, brought close. How? By the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ. How is sin dealt with? How is the barrier of sin that separates you and your God? How is this barrier to be removed? Through the blood of Christ. Through the blood of Christ. You see, the gospel is twofold, really. The gospel is to do with the life of Christ and also the death of Christ. 
You know, the blood of Christ, it, it covers both aspects, the perfect life of Christ and the atoning death of Christ. You see, you need the life of Christ. I'll explain why. You and I, we have broken God's law. We put the barrier up. We quite literally got the trowel and the bricks and the cement together and sin after sin after sin. We created the barrier for ourselves. That's what we did. We did that to us. We did it ourselves. But Christ, well, he lived a perfectly sinless, righteous, obedient life. He didn't sin once. Not even once. Not in thought, not in word, not indeed, he didn't sin once. Perfect life. We see that in Ephesians 2. Look at the verse 15. He says, having abolished in his flesh the enmity. He abolished this, this separation between Jew and Gentile, but more than just abolishing that, he abolishes the wall, the barrier of sin in his flesh, in his life. That's what he does. And then in his atoning death as he died upon the tree, as he shed his precious blood, as you think of the nails and the lashings and the thorns and all of those things, and then he, he bore the wrath of the Father and gave up the ghost, all of it. It is this, the perfect life of Christ, that breaks down this middle wall. And the verse 13 says, But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of of Christ. Why is it that we sing about the blood? You ever thought about it? We sing there's power in the blood, don't we? And yet I believe most Christians don't understand why the blood is so precious to them. Because the blood, the blood was apparent and there and precious and, and working in both aspects to the gospel in the perfect life and in the atoning death. You see, Leviticus tells us the life of the flesh is in the blood. Every one of us are alive today because there is blood flowing through your veins. Now, some may have high blood pressure, low blood pressure, any other type of pressure, but you're only alive today because you have blood in your veins. And so the blood was apparent in the perfect life of Christ. That perfect life could never have been achieved and attained without the blood. And we find that blood was shed upon the cross. It wasn't spilled. It wasn't accidental, but it was deliberately shed as he sacrificed himself. And the blood is apparent in both aspects to the gospel, in the perfect life and the atoning death of Christ. And that's why the blood is, is precious to the believer. And it's by the blood of Christ that this wall is broken down. By the blood of Christ God hath broken down this middle wall of partition between us. Essentially, Christ is the answer. Christ is the answer. That's who you need. That's what you need. Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9 tell us, by the way, it's not your works. This is probably the greatest myth in so-called Christendom today, where people think they can work their way to heaven. Verse 8 tells you, For by grace ye are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So it's not of works. Come with me to Matthew chapter 7. I want you to note that you're not saved because of religion either. You know, Christianity, true biblical Protestantism, true Christianity is not a religion it is a relationship. It is a relationship with an individual, namely the Son of God, God manifest in the flesh, the God-man, Jesus Christ, the righteous. But religion, religion will condemn you to hell. Look what we find in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. There's going to be plenty of religious people in hell. I would dare say, I would dare say that hell has more religious people in it than atheists. I don't believe there'll ever be an atheist in hell because all men in hell know there's a God by that stage. Matthew chapter 7 verse 21 says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. This is sad. I've underlined it. Verse 22, Many, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. 
Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So we find, yes, uh, I'm sorry, but good works will never get you there. Religion will never get you to glory. Well, what is the answer? Come with me to John chapter 14. And John chapter 14 will give you the answer you require. The answer you desire, maybe not, but it's the answer you require. And John 14 and the verse 6 tells us that it is Christ. It is Christ that's the answer. You want this removal of this barrier, this separation, this wall of sin? You want it done away with so you can be reconciled to God? Well, the only answer is Christ. John 14 verse 6 says, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. That is the, the, the great I am's of Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You know, that isn't the type of sermons that the apostasy preach today. They preach that all roads lead to heaven. Jesus teaches only one road leads to heaven, and that's him. That's him alone. And that's why Paul says, you want this middle wall of partition broken? Well, you need to be brought nigh by the blood of Christ. Christ alone. He's the only answer. He's the only answer for your soul. But then thirdly and lastly, very quickly, we've noted the reason for the barrier, it's sin. The removal of the barrier, it's Christ alone. Well, thirdly, the reconciliation after the barrier. What happens when the barrier comes down? I don't know. Some of you, I'd imagine most of you actually, will remember when the Berlin Wall came down. And it's one thing to tear down a wall. A whole lot of anarchy after that. What do we actually do now? Put it politically to keep stability. What do we do? What do we do now that the barrier is brought down? Well, well, you say, okay, my sin, this barrier, Christ, he, he can rip this barrier down. Well, well, what happens after the barrier is removed? Reconciliation with God. That's what happens. Look at the verse 16. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity, thereby reconciliation with God. You know, there's reconciliation in Christ between the Jew and the Gentile. Yes, that's referred to in the portion that these two bodies, formerly Jew, Gentile, they're going to be one body reconciled to God. But that's not what Paul's really getting at. It's referring to this enmity that stood between God and men, and now they're reconciled together. Peace at last. Come with me to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, because this is something that I believe this world is craving. Craving peace. You see, people will try and buy peace. People argue for peace. You have hippies that try and declare their methods for world peace. People love the idea of peace. They do. They want peace, generally speaking. People will try and buy peace with trinkets and Material things and all the rest, my friend, there's only one way you can have true and lasting peace. And the only peace that matters, peace with God, is by being saved, being right with God, having this middle wall of partition broken down. Romans 5 verse 1 says, Therefore being justified by faith. It's referring to those that have, uh, that have had their sins cast on Christ and he died for them and those that wear the righteousness, the perfect life of Christ, and those that are justified, legally declared righteous, saved, Christians on the way to heaven, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what you need, friend, peace with God. Peace with God is what you require. Maybe you're here and you don't realize that's what you require. Maybe you're here and you say, preacher, maybe you're just exaggerating. Do I really need this? Is it needed? Why do I need peace with God? I'll tell you why. Because hell is real. Hell is real. The justice of God is real. The wrath of God is real. 
You know, Matthew chapter 10 and the verse 28 tells us famously, Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. You know, friend, if you're not going to have peace with this God, if you're not going to be reconciled with this God, if you continually keep building up block after block after block, this wall of sin, this separation, this barrier, and you say, no Christ for me, no breaking of the barrier for me, I love my sin too much, I tell you this, the day will come, the day will arrive, whether soon or latterly, but the day will arrive when one day that barrier of sin will cause you to be condemned to eternal damnation and hell forevermore. Because God is a just and a holy God. And hell is real, friend. Hell is real. Maybe you say, well, I don't want my sin. Hallelujah for it. I'm glad you've come to that position. I don't want my sin anymore. I don't want the hell that the barrier of sin will, will cause me to enter. You say, what do I do? What do I do? How, how do I how do we brought, be brought nigh by the blood of Christ, as the verse 13 says? How, how do I have this peace that the verse 14 says when it says, He is our peace? Oh, what do I do? How do I get this, this middle wall of partition broken down? How, how do I have my sin abolished? How, how do I have a reconciliation with God? Maybe you say, Preacher, I want this salvation, but how do I possess it? How do I attain it? Well, friend, once again, you need Christ. You know, Mark chapter 1. In Mark chapter 1, we find the Lord's first recorded sermon. And in the verse 15, the Lord began his ministry by saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Repent ye and believe the gospel. You want to be saved today? As I've already indicated, it's not about works, it's not about religion, it's not about going to church, it's not about giving to charity, it's not about being a good neighbor, it's not about having a good, clean, moral compass, it's not about doing all sorts of uh, good stuff. That's not what it's about, friend. Not about that at all. It's about repenting and believing the gospel. It's about coming to God God's way. That's the key. So many want to come to God their own way, you need to come to God, God's way. And God's way is repentance. God's way is belief in the gospel. Repent ye and believe the gospel. And I'm just going to plainly ask you, what about you tonight? What about you? Is there some soul, young or old, maybe some boy, some girl, some older person, whoever, friend, in between, middle-aged, whatever, but is there still that wall of partition, that barrier of sin, that hindrance that is in your life, hindering you from being right and reconciled and at peace with God? If there is, then come to Christ. Trust Christ alone. Repent of your sin. Turn from your sin. Believe the gospel. Do it now. Don't delay. Don't put it off. But I appeal to you, be right with God. And you can be brought nigh by the blood of Christ. You can know that he is our peace, my peace. And you can say then that he hath broken down the middle wall of partition, the barrier of sin. I trust you won't leave that barrier up tonight. But I trust You'll allow Christ to break it down, demolish it, and see it finished so that you can be reconciled to God. Let's bow in a word of prayer together, please. Let's seek the Lord's face. Eternal God and loving Heavenly Father, we thank Thee and we praise Thee for the Word. We thank Thee and praise Thee for all that Christ has done. We thank Thee and praise Thee that all of our sin, the large wall and barrier that it put between us and our God, we rejoice that Christ has done all the work necessary to see it broken down and demolished forever. But, O oh, Father, Thou knowest there is some soul maybe in this gathering tonight, and as yet they're hanging on to their sin, as yet they're denying Christ, as yet they're saying, no God for me. 
and leave me in my sin. Oh, God, convict them of their sin this evening. Show them their need of being right with thee. Allow them the help required to repent and believe the gospel. Save them, Lord. Save them by thy grace. Lord, if any, even a feeling that tug on the heartstrings tonight to be saved. Oh, Father, we pray that they would not deny the pleadings of thy Spirit, but that they would come, praying the sinner's prayer, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Bless us now. Take us to our homes in safety. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.